لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Today we're looking at Surah Yusuf uh, This is a Makkan Surah uh, Comprising of some 110 verses and the thing that sets it apart from all other surahs is the fact that this is one of the few long surahs that was revealed in its entirety. In most cases, surahs were revealed piecemeal. So you'd have a particular part of Surah Baqarah, for instance, revealed. And then months would go past, other verses would be revealed. And then Rasulullah would then assemble the scribes and then collate it. So to give you an overview of how the, the process of revelation worked, it was not like every surah was revealed, as you would say in Arabic, jumla in one, one, one big piece together. Uh, the very small surahs were obviously revealed in one piece. But the longer ones were sometimes revealed where 10 verses would be revealed in, in conjunct together with each other. And then the remaining verses would be revealed perhaps years thereafter. Then Rasulullah would have the task of uh, putting these together. Uh, this brings to mind the, the difficulty, anyone who's written an article that's more than one page long, uh, and let alone someone who writes a book, the difficulty you have keeping, have keeping your thoughts together and creating some kind of continuity. And for a book as, as big as the Quran is, containing some 600 odd pages, it, was, it had to be the book of Allah and one that had to be revised repeatedly. Rasulullah tells us that uh, Jibreel would come down and he would come down particularly in the month of Ramadan and during that time they would go through the Quran and they would revise its settings and so on. So this therefore is the way in which the Quran was put together. And uh, to go back to Surah Yusuf, Surah Yusuf is uh, what actually revealed to satisfy the curiosity of the companions that was the direct reason for revelation. So, you know, we, look, we, we listen to the Jews speak, speak about th their stories and we, or we get snippets from other religions and for the most part, they have lovely narrations, you know, thematic narrations. And human beings by nature are, they are attracted to, to narratives. They don't like to be given uh, pieces of advice if that advice is not underscored by some n narration. Generally, the style of the Quran is to refer you to a story without engaging in the minutia of that story, the, the, the details of the story. So it would tell you in several places, for instance, where Allah talk, he talks about Musa and rarely would you find any single part of the Quran where the story of Musa salam, is presented in its entirety. Scholars were therefore forced to, when looking at the, at the narratives about Ibrahim or Musa, to, to bring all of those verses together, depend on a hadith of the Prophet wasallam and sometimes to even go into the Old and the New Testament in order to give that story some kind of form. The objective was not to, to become uh, embroiled and stuck in the story's details, but rather to talk about the moral, ethical, spiritual teachings that were embedded in that particular surah or in that particular story. In this case, however, the story comes in its entirety and it is a fascinating story. That's the one thing that I want to share with you. I'm not going to go through the, the surah verse by verse. We, it's a long surah and I wouldn't be doing it justice. I'm going to go over it and hopefully 
uh, you have some idea of what the surah comprises of. We'll talk about that. What the surah does for us is it, it, it brings to our attention the mode of revelation. As Muslims, we believe that Allah reveals his, himself and his thoughts to his messengers. And because he revealed himself to Rasulullah in a particular way, we therefore assume that this was the mode of revelation to all the prophets. And that's not the case. Here you can see that there is a very uh, uh, close relationship between Allah and Yusuf alayhi salam. But there's no revelation as we understand revelation. He doesn't reveal a particular verse. There are no chapters that the chapters on Moses where Allah sends down particular revelation to Moses, that is not there. This is why scholars sometimes make the distinction between a Nabi and a Rasul by, by saying that a Nabi is one who receives, revel, who does not receive revelation, he simply continues with the revelation of some previous prophet. And a Rasul is one who might receive revelation in his entirety, or he might not receive revelation in his entirety, but he is given laws and a, a jurisprudence that sets his communities apart from all other communities. So there are two things that separate a Nabi from a Rasul. We're not absolutely certain which applies to which, but we do know that these are the two distinguishing qualities that separate a Nabi from a Rasul in that one of them does not receive revelation whilst the other does, number one. Number two, one of them is given a new set of laws which the other one was not given. So this is what sets them apart. Yusuf alayhi salam, it would seem, was not given any of this. Despite that, he's also considered a Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other thing we find peculiar about Yusuf alayhi salam is that Yusuf alayhi salam is not sent to his community as such. He has a very peculiar role in that, in, 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 in that particular surah. When we again think about a Nabi, we think about Ibrahim alayhi salam sent, sent to his own people. We think of Rasulullah sent to humanity at large. Think about Isa alayhi salam sent to the Jews and then becomes, the, becomes more than just the messenger of Allah. Yusuf alayhi salam's story is, is deeply embedded firstly in his family. The whole family drama going on right there. And then he gets, he gets embroiled in this sexual encounter and then he becomes part of the political authority. That's his story. At no part is he asked to go to a particular community and give them guidance. Nor is there an emphasis on shirk and kufr. So this is a very different take on a messenger and his terms of reference. He's not focusing on shirk and kufr. He makes a point about, you know, where, where he talks to the two uh, co-prisoners, remember that? And then he starts off, before telling them the interpretation of the dream, he just makes one statement. Is, is one God not better than the many gods that you worship? <laughs> but for the most part, now clearly you might say that, well, the Quran doesn't focus on it in this particular instance, but that's not to say that Yusuf Ali, Yusuf Ali Islam did not have that kind of a responsibility. But I think not, because the Quran is saying that his primary responsibility in terms of what he, what he provided to the community was one that set him apart from all other MBR. He was part of the political bureaucracy. No other Nabi was part of a political bureaucracy. And he asked to be part of the political bureaucracy. Ij'alni ala khaza'in al awl. Make me the exchequer of the treasury. We call him what? Secretary of Finance in this country. <coughs> the other uh, somewhat awkward thing about this, this position is that generally in Islam, asking for a position of authority is scoffed upon. You know that, right? 
right? That you, sh that you should not, in fact, there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that says that if someone aspires to, to a position of authority, then you should deny him that position. In this case, however, Yusuf ﷺ says, put me in charge. Which, also, which, which tells us that we ought to broaden our understanding of, of this restriction that Islam generally places upon pursuits of authority. That is, you have to give a position to someone who is best equipped to handle that position. And Rasul and Yusuf salam was equipped to do that. And him not presenting himself for that position would have done the entire nation of Egypt a huge disservice. See the point? He's not simply asking to be king of Egypt. He's saying, put me in charge of the treasury. You have some bad times coming. There's going to be a massive drought. You need someone with admin, admin skills to be able to manage that particular period. So I have the, those skills, put me in charge. So that, that's the other thing that stands out about Yusuf alayhi salam. The third thing that stands out about, about Yusuf alayhi salam is the mode of, of wahi that he got. Rasulullah tells us that wahi has many parts to it. One of them is this, this true dream. But our dreams are contestable. In other words, if you say, I had a dream of something that happened, I can ignore it. But the dream of a prophet is a true dream. But he didn't get revelation like Rasulullah got, for instance. And the Quran doesn't focus on him receiving revelation. It, speaks, it focuses, his, his expertise would seem to lie in his ability to interpret revelation. Uh, the dreams. So you have two, three different times, I think, or two different times where he is asked, where he, so, where he is asked to interpret the dream. So that shows you that not all prophets had the same kind of revelation, nor did they apply that in a particular way. And 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 if you look at the 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 the. Uh, subject matter of the revelation, in both cases it had to do with people's welfare, material welfare. In the first case, if you remember, it was about these two people who co-prisoners with him and asked him, what, you know, what's to, we've had this dream, uh, so that birds are eating off the head of, of my head and the other one is crushing grapes and he says, as for you, you're going to become the uh, the uh, uh, what is the name for that now? I forget. Anyway, you're going to be the, the cup bearer of the king. You're going to be the cup bearer of the king, and as for the other one, you're going to be executed. So this talks about the conditions of those people. It doesn't talk about you know people. People should be following the right path and so on. And the other, it talks about the condition of the community. The first case, two individuals. In the other case, the entire community. And, and then Yusuf salam says, well, the fat cow eating the thin cow and dry stalks of wheat standing next to uh, what you call fresh stalks of wheat, what do they indicate? And he says, well, it indicates that you're going to have seven years of hardship and then eventually things are going to work out for you. And this brings us therefore to the, to the other phenomena that we, we notice around us that happens all the time. This, this, we call it a seven year phenomenon. So when we look at our economy, we, pre we were predicting for the past 20 odd years, I think, that this the economy is, is, is about to, to, go, to go downwards, right? To suffer a recession. Uh, the uh, stock market <coughs> value is supposed to fall. Nobody wants it to fall, but everyone's <laughs> anticipating it because it's part of that cycle. It's part of that cycle. Does Ra'una Sab'a Sinina? 
that you're going to be you're going to be planting for seven years, and after those seven years, you're going to have good crops. After that, bad crops. That becomes a cycle, and so you find that in our when we look at economic projections, we also factor that in. When we talk about ourselves, we look at if you're 40, 50 years old, and you look at the past, and you say, "Wow, I've had some bad, bad times and some good times." And when you look at those bad times and good times, you find that they actually of they're not more of, of a longer duration than is normal. So it's not like something that lasts you for a day or two or a year or two. Sometimes it goes on for years. And you start wondering if there's ever ever is there any light in at the end of this tunnel? Everything seems so bleak and so dark. And so this particular verse of the Quran and this element of the Quran it gives us some hope and it also brings to light that uh, I think this is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu himself, he says never be too happy for you know not that you know there's sadness somewhere in the future never be too sad for you know that there is some happiness in the future you have you have to be economical in in, in, in the way you deal with your emotions the outburst, outburst of joy or the outburst of sadness. In both cases, know that there is a turn at the end of this, uh, there is a bend at the end of this road, and it's going to take you into a better place than you were, or a worse place than you were in the past. So these are, these are some of the differences and similarities. The striking parallel here between Yusuf salam and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, is there to see. Yusuf starts life in a very uncomfortable place. Yusuf is not an orphan. He's a semi-orphan. Rasulullah was an orphan entirely. And so this, well, in Surah Buhayi, وَجَدَكَ يَتِيوَنْ فَآوَى Yusuf had a father, but his mother was late. Or, according to other reports, he was, he was one of two children born of a second wife. So that puts him at a disadvantage. And then he, numerically, he was, they, his side of the family was smaller than the other brothers. They were ten, these were two. They were much, much older, they were much, much younger. So you see that kind of pain. And, and, and I haven't had the, the unfortunate experience, some of you may have had that, where you're born to, you know, there's a really nice book out there, ladies are going to love what I'm going to say now, there's a really nice book out there about children who are born in, 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 a, in a polygamous marriage. You know, you have a husband with three wives or two wives. Nobody asks the kids, you know, what was life like? And, and, and so they, I can't recall the name of the book, I'll find it if you're interested. And they actually do a, a do research as to what, what impact that has on the child, being being the children of the second wife. And, and here clearly the Quran is talking about that. It, it should give us some, some moment for pause because in our, in our efforts to defend this idea of polygamy in Islam, uh, we get to the point where we are almost celebrating it. Whereas the Quran here clearly tells you, well, you know, depending on your birth order, you're not going to be living a very happy life if you're, if you're part of a polygamous marital household, two wives, and then obviously your, your birth order will also have an impact on that. So it, it's, it's very clear this is what happens. Yusuf is being discriminated against because of that. And the animosity is intense. It is intense. They want to kill him. And all of them con concur that let's get rid of him. One of them had more sense than the, than the others and he said, let's not do that. Let's just <coughs> abandon, him, abandon him in that well. That seems to be the point at which Yusuf realizes that he is more than just a mere mortal. Because at that point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets involved in his life directly and, and tells him that, you know, 
these people are engaging in this and they have no idea what they're doing. And a time will come in the future when all of this will be revealed to them. So you, you, you look at this little boy being abandoned in, in, this, in this well and at, that, at the darkest of his moments, that's when he gets the greatest of help. That's, that's perhaps the, the, both the, 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 the deepest but also the, 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 the saddest part of the story. I mean, there's, there's, children have a certain innocence. And I don't know if, if Yusuf felt the animosity that his brother had towards him. Uh, but being abandoned in a, in, in a well uh, is perhaps the, 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 the most outrageous, the saddest thing someone can experience. And it is at this point, the closer that comes to mind, you might find something even sadder in, in Rasulullah's life. But when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is in life, and he is beaten to a pulp, and he's sitting there on that little bunk, I, I, I had the good fortune of actually going right to that spot. It's it's right there, uh, and uh, Jibreel there comes. So it's the, it's it's the, the the darkest moment of the life of Rasulullah, but also the brightest. Because he asks, you know, he says, if you want, I can bring these two mountains together and destroy these people. And he says, no, don't do that. Good people will come from this society. This was the Banu Thaqif. And Muhammad bin Qasim al Thaqafi comes from that society. Although now, now there's a whole conflict within Pakistan about whether he's a good person or not. I don't know if you're aware of that. But, but generally our understanding of Muhammad bin Qasim is what you would call Fatih Hind, the one who opened up in South Asia. So you have these two images of the two Anbiya going through this very sad moment in their lives. And then you have this whole question of infidelity. In the case of Yusuf alayhi salam, he is himself accused of infidelity. In the case of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, it's his wife who is, who is accused of infidelity, Aisha. And in both cases, the pain is just insurmountable, it's massive. Uh, perhaps it's something that we might not, I'm just assuming, given, given the level at which infidelity, promiscuity is rampant in our society, uh, we might shrug this off and say, you know, these things happen. But in a, in a community where these things rarely happen, if ever, for someone in such a position of authority to be accused. And with Yusuf alayhi salam, the only thing he seemed to have had when he was living in the house of Aziz was his self-respect. That's all. Because he had been purchased, so he's a slave. Is living in someone else's house. And when this Quran tells us about the wife of the Aziz having designs on him, it's not, it, that's not the start of it. Sure, he, he felt this and he had, to, he had to, to find ways around that living in the same house and more importantly being utterly dependent on them. It's not like you can go out there and talk to the local, dial 911 and call the cops and say, you know, I'm being abused. You have to, you have to, it's very hard for us, but you, you have to take away those, those safety nets. These people don't have that. This is someone who was taken out of Canaan and brought to Egypt. And now he's living at the mercy of this Aziz, who was generally a nice person. And then suddenly he finds himself in this very unpleasant situation. And the wife seemed to have been very attractive as well. I mean, there's all, all of these little things are just embedded in the verses themselves in a, in a, in a really nice way. It says, That she was inclined to seduce him. Now, you know, you have all of these stops in the Quran, right? If you've done Quranic studies, you know there's, there's a stop that is, a, 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 that is a, what you call lazim. Right? But then you have one that tells you you should not stop and so on. Now here's, here you see how the, these, whether you stop or not will determine the meaning of the verse. 
He says, Wahamla biha, if you stop there, then you are saying that Yusuf too was inclined towards her. When you stop there. Lola an ra'a burhan rabbi. And he would have gone a step further if he had not been given or shown the sign of Allah. That come to your senses, you know what you're doing is wrong. Or it could be Wahamma biha lola an ra'a burhan rabbi that he too would have been inclined towards her. If you, without, without stopping there, he too would have, he was not. Why? Because Allah had shown him signs. And these signs were the signs that came to him repeatedly after the incident in the cave, that you are a noble character and a noble creature, and we have a high place for you. So all of these things build character. They, pre they prepare that individual for his future destiny. That, that, that's when you, most ulama are of the opinion that that's how it should be read. That if he had not, that he had not had within his heart this desire to want to seduce her. And then the whole story then breaks out into the, into the, the city or the country that is Egypt and tongues start wagging. It says, well, you know, and this is the creme de la creme of society, the upper crust, and people start talking about the wife of the Aziz wanting to seduce the slave. And so she shows, she, she brings them together, have a party, and she tells Yusuf, go out there. And so when they see Yusuf, they too understand the, the seductiveness of his features. He was a very handsome, attractive human being. And uh, so she says, now you see why I was seduced. Then eventually he is put into prison and he spends many years in prison. Now for us, you know, there are three verses that say he spent many years in prison and that whole period of his life in prison is just gone over. Spending a week in prison like, what's her name, the lady with the, with the you can't spend 14 days in prison. You know what I'm talking about, right? 14 days in prison. Yusuf had to spend years in prison because the person he had, he had prophesied about had forgotten to inform the outsider that, you know, there's someone, there's an innocent human being in here who needs to be freed. And so that entire time he spent in prison, hoping that Allah will open the doors for him. And the doors do get opened. And he comes out of there on his condition that he must be exonerated. Remember I told you at the outset that his, his, the only thing that he valued was his self-respect. So when the king said, bring him unto me so that he can be with me and he can provide me with the most important tool you need to run a country, information, data, analysis, I want that. Of course, that was supernatural information. Now we have people who do data analysis and they'll tell you these are your sales projections for the next, next six months and this is how much your, 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 your purchases are and so on. But the king was very, very aware of the need to have someone who had that kind of information. And Yusuf said, no, I'd rather stay in prison. I'm only going to accept this if, you, if I'm exonerated. So ask this woman, what, what is all this about me wanting to seduce them? And then it comes out that that uh, they were actually manipulative and they had contrived to against him. Uh, two or three things that I want, want to say before I conclude. This, you know, there's, there's a whole area of study today, this is the other part of my life, uh, a whole area of study today in, in, in academics that looks at the Quran through modern lenses and one of them is the lens of what you'd call the, fem the feminists. So a feminist analysis of the surah shows the empowerment of women at the time of Yusuf. So that if you read some of these articles out there, they say that you know not all society were, had women who were servile and subservient to the male. Here this woman, what you think to be an act of, of of uh, impropriety 
Yusuf, uh, Aziz's wife wanting to seduce Yusuf. Modern feminist scholars use that as an example of a society hundreds if not thousands of years old where women were empowered enough, you understand, to want to engage in this kind of practice. So there are quite a few such articles and, and some of the people who write these articles are Muslims and you know you have to uh, sit down and listen to them and read them and uh, they're interesting. They're all part, they, you get caught up in, 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 in uh, uh, feminist studies. Feminist studies are women's studies, feminist studies are an, an integral part of, of modern, modern studies. So this becomes part of that. And, uh, and then of course there is this guile of, of there, there, there's some parts of, the, of that particular surah that ulama have had difficulty explaining that was Yusuf alayhi salam and trapping his brothers, another story about the, about the goblet, was, he in, was that a, a case of entrapment? Because it, it would seem that, that he told one of his workers, take this goblet, put it into the, into the bag, and uh, let's see what happens. So he does that and then they get caught. Of course the ter story turns out fine. But the mere idea that a messenger of Allah could have engaged in this kind of entrapment, it is out of sync with our understanding of who a Nabi is. You know, a Nabi is a, is a blameless human being who does not intentionally engage in such surreptitious uh, acts. So the best I could find was that Yusuf actually had no intent of, of, of entrapping him. What he wanted to do was give this to his brother as a gift and so he could take it with him and because this was a barter economy it was, was not based on coinage it was not based on money so we could go took this valuable thing with him and off he went then he would you know give it to his father and they could use that so that's Yusuf's side of the story in the meantime the servants around there they looked for this expensive garment and they found it missing it just so happened so they went to call a meeting of, of coincidences. Yusuf wanting to enrich his father with something that belonged to him. And the servant is going around and says, hey, what happened to that goblet? And so they find the goblet in, in, the, in, the, in the satchel of Ibn Yamin, and then Ibn Yamin is kept, and, and that's, that's the story. But this, these are one of the, the, the points at which scholars have difficulty saying, well, the story seems to say that Yusuf made the whole thing up. But a Nabi doesn't do that. So their, their uh, alternative explanation is that Yusuf salam had no intent of uh, implicating his brother in, a, in, a, in an act that he, the brother was not involved in. <coughs> Just like if you have any questions, you can ask him now. Yes. You know, this is a this perspective I have heard first time that Mr. Islam was trying to entrap his brother. But you know, if you see even in the Quran, in the next verse, Allah has said that Allah taught this plan to Yusuf so that he can keep his brother with him. Which makes it entrapment. It's not entrapment because he did not have intention to entrap him. He just wants to make, you know, comfortable his other brother than his younger brother that they do not blame anybody. But you see, you but see, you, you, you see the, the point of, of those who, who, who understand that in Islam you have a particular image of a Nabi, that he is masoom. And you know, this, so it, this goes against that. So in order to avoid that, people make, in the same way when they talk about Yusuf being attracted to the woman, they, they, they read the verse as I did, Bil Wasli, in order to avoid that. Although you and I would concede readily that they were all human beings and, 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 and one of the most important dimension of a human being is this, this attraction to the opposite sex. So there's, there's nothing essentially wrong with that. But, but we are very sensitive about that and, and Islam is one of the few religions, it's, it's the only Abrahamic religion that insists on the concept of Islam. It's important for us to know that. that this idea that a Nabi is by his very nature, Masu. 
Our Shia brothers and sisters go a point beyond that. They, they add two things to this. One is that the, uh, the, the Imams of the, of the Shia community are also ma'asum. And the third is that, the, that they are ma'asum anil khat'i. We don't, we don't say that. We don't say that Nabis don't make mistakes. We say they do and they have and their Quran is replete with areas where a Nabi has made a mistake. And then Allah then guides him and, and, and rectifies the mistake. But the idea that the Nabi is, is, is free of sin is a uniquely Islamic idea. It's not something that Jews or Christians share in. For them, a, David was lustful of the wife of that, of, of, of what's his name, I forget, Portia, I think. Uh, and, and so he sent him out from the biblical Christian perspective is that he actually sent him and put him in the front of the warring forces so that he could get killed and that then you, David could marry his wife. For us, that's, that's, that's an abomination, that's outrageous. Because of our belief that a Nabi is masum, And the reason we insist that a Nabi is free of sin is in order to protect the message that he brings to humanity. It's, it's, all, it's all tied up. And, and so that makes us very distinct from Christians and Jews. So when you're talking to Christians and Jews, you should always remember that their perspective on prophethood and the characteristics of a prophet are different from ours. Sometimes when they say things that would be blasphemous from our perspective, perspective even about Rasulullah, they mean well actually. They're not saying this to simply, quite often they don't mean well, but sometimes they're simply saying that because he's human and you're the first, you, one of your criticisms, they talk to us, criticism against Christianity is the fact that you, you've done what? That Christians be accused them of defying Jesus. <laughs> you've turned a mere mortal into a, a God-like creature. Says, but your belief system does the same with, with all the messengers of God. So it's important for us to remember that. Else? And secondly, secondly, you said that uh, he had a different mode of getting revelation by Allah that correct either through dream or inspiration of his heart. But I think there is a hadith when he went through the well, Jibrail came and he you know, spread his wing so that he, that he could not touch the water. So I think Jibrail also used to come to him for... Uh, that tradition is not strong. But that's not revelation. That's just connection with Gabriel. So, you know, we're not saying that there's no connection with Gabriel. We're simply saying that revelation and connection with Gabriel are not necessarily the same thing. So he had angelic connection, but he doesn't have the same type of revelation that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received. Story. Yeah, yeah, in the Talmud and in the New Testament as well. There's a, it's pretty much they are similar. Uh, this, yeah, when I, my first introduction to Yusuf Ali Salam, uh, actually, uh, I first got to go to church every Thursday before I got to go to mosque on a Friday. Uh, that's how life was in South Africa. We, we, I went to a, 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 a Christian a seminary school, St. Aidan's, and uh, so it was required that we go to church on a Thursday. And that's when I got to learn about Jesus Joseph. And that's when I got to know about his technicolor coat, that Joseph had this coat. The Quran obviously has nothing like that. Uh, the, according to Muhammad Asad, He's of the opinion that whereas the Old Testament and the New Testament use the Joseph story to celebrate the greatness of Allah, His Majesty, that Allah overcomes everything, the well, prison, it, it's all Allah, you know, imposing His will upon human beings. The story of Joseph from Rasul, from the Muslim perspective, is about the human being that is Jesus, that is Yusuf. It's it's clear it, it is Allah who is who is guiding Yusuf, but it's to is to highlight his trials and tribulations, the, the 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 challenges he faced, 
And I, I haven't looked at the Old and the New Testament in, this, with, with as much, uh, uh, in as much detail, so I can't vouch for that, but I, I, I see when he says that, that yes, there is, there's a point to be made there. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, it raises a question that when we look at the stories of other Indians in the Quran, the Nabua or their prophets were different, were different seems like from his Islam. The story of Yusuf al-Islam, when we say, when we see the story of Nuh al-Islam or Musa al-Islam or Isa al-Islam, they have a prophet, they have a nation that they were preaching. But Yusuf al-Islam is this very different. Uh, it's this side like a story. What's the hikmah behind it? What? Are you asking about the story or about the, about the people he was he was sent to? The people he was sent to and what I know the message was all published in Allah. But when you go to strike from that from that sort of Well, I mean, it's good you ask this question. One of the key differences between the Joseph story and and, and, and the, Pro the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam story is you, when, Rasul, when Islam tells you or the Quran tells you that this is a community of Ummiyun. One of the meanings of Ummiyun is that they're not part of a, of a prophetic revelatory tradition. Whereas in Yusuf, Yusuf is in the center of a community where revelation, there's no talk in that particular story, in the Yusuf story, about believing in Allah and talking to people who don't believe in Him. These people do believe in Him. There's no talk in there about believing in revelation. These people do believe in revelation. It's the twists and the turns in the life of one person in that tradition that is celebrated in the Yusuf story. But these Ummi Yur are people who had no connection with Revelation. The people of, of, of Makkah, the Arabs. You know, I, you know, uh, I was a little bit of a, 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 a paper not too long ago, ago about uh, a Jewish sage who was actually buried in Delhi. And uh, a very Big Ali, very big Ali. Uh, his name is Abul Kalam Azad. He actually wrote a commentary on the poetry. When I'm doing this, I'm trying to find the name of the sage. The, the poetry of this of this sage who moved, he came from, came either from Kazakhstan or from Afghanistan, moved into India, and then accepted Islam. And when I, when I finished, the questions I got were unusual. Until someone told me, the problem you're having is that there are Jewish professors sitting in the audience and they cannot accept that a Jew could have become a Muslim. To anything but a Muslim. Therefore they're asking you these very odd questions. And then I did more research and there are two or three articles in which they, they write either that he never accepted Islam or that he first became Muslim and then reverted to, to Judaism. So nobody in his right mind, in other words, can either become Muslim or can remain Muslim. You know, the, 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 this, this outcast, from, and when you look at the Quran in teaching, you find that the Jewish community's criticism, even in 7th century Arabia was, Arabs, Revelation, Holy Book, not likely. That still endures. Sarmat Kashani. That's his name. Sarmat Kashani. Abul Kalam turned his, his, his entire life turned after he read the poetry of Sarmat and then that's how he became a secularist. It's a fascinating story. And Sarmat Kashani. He's buried outside the, the Jama Masjid in Delhi. So there, there's, there's, there is this idea that revelation couldn't possibly come to, to, to people like that. That was, that was a big objection to Rasulullah and his message. You see it in the Quran all the time. So you wonder why. Is, no, this is the idea that revelation is, belongs to us. Prophethood belongs to us. Holy books belong to us. Can't possibly go anywhere else. And then suddenly it comes and it comes to a non-Jewish. So this is all tied to that. 
Muhammad Assad himself, Dr. Paul Weiss, who, had, who was at one point the secretary for the foreign ministry of Pakistan, when Pakistan first gave, gave independence. I can show that to you, Muhammad. Mazhar is one guy you have to actually show him the evidence before he's going to accept what you say. Yes, he was. His name was Muhammad Assad. And uh, people can accept that he's Muslim. To this day, they can accept that he's Muslim. He wrote an outstanding translation of the Quran called The Meaning of the Quran. A brilliant person. Wrote about government in Islam, wrote a, 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 a small shara on the Bukhari. But Jews just can't get, just can't let him go. They let Jesus go, though. All right. Anyone else? Jazakum. Well, also, in the